What's up guys? You may have noticed from my slightly less scrappy appearance today that this is a special day. Grade E of the Carrot Poker School, the course that uses mass data analysis, has just dropped and you can get it right now at CarrotCorner.com. Mass data analysis is the process of using a very large sample of hands to map out where the population of poker players that you guys play against on a daily basis is unbalanced. Where are they bluffing too often, not bluffing enough, folding too much, calling too much? Grade E covers tons of important common spots and shows you exactly how your opponents are playing. By watching the videos that we've compiled where we organize this mass data across lots of different board textures, action sequences, preflop, positional configurations and matchups, you're going to be able to avoid the pitfall of overgeneralizing. This is a huge issue. People say things like, oh, it's micro stakes, so people are not bluffing enough, you should fold, without even engaging with all of those factors. So you don't have to guess at exploits anymore after you take this course, and you also don't have to just rely on your best imitation of a GTO strategy. Your win rate's going to be much higher when you use actual pool data to guide your exploitative play. But don't worry guys, this is not just one gigantic plug of a video. We're going to give you some grade E data today for free, so definitely watch this one all the way to the end. We're going to look at three spots today that one of my 100 Zoom students has faced, and in each of these spots, he's facing a triple barrel from the opponent. The table of data we're going to look at from grade E is going to tell us how to handle triple barrels by outlining exactly how often regulars were observed to be bluffing, button versus big blind, when they triple barrel across different bet sizes. So let's get started. I really think you're going to enjoy this one. Put your feet up. And if you do feel like you're ready to take the plunge and bring your exploitative game to the next level by seeking absolute clarity on how regulars and recreationals are playing a ton of different spots, then head on over to CarrotCorner.com and pick up Grade E of the Carrot Poker School. You can start watching it immediately upon purchase. We've moved all our videos to on-site. No more need for big bulky downloadable files or anything like that. And if you want to save 700 UK pounds, that's about, I think, $850, something like that then why not get the full scholarship? This gets you grades one, two, three, those are the theory grades of the CPS, and grade E at the same time for a massive saving. Okay, enough plugging. Let's see the data, let's see the hands. Let's go. Okay guys, here's how we're going to do this. We're gonna start by meeting the three spots in question, and then we're going to refer to grade E for a bit of guidance. When we get to the data, when I actually present you a table of data on how people are behaving button versus big blind when they triple barrel across different bet sizes, we will take that data with a pinch of salt. Grade E is not just some look it up, see if the spots bluff too much, and then act accordingly. You do have to use it intelligently because there are other factors later in the course, which I'm also going to tell you a bit about for free today. You're going to get lots of juicy mass data stuff in this video, so do keep watching right the way until the end. And I'm going to show you how position and board texture actually impact things as well. So it's not just going to be about bet size. The real skill in using mass data is being able to combine the factors to reach the right conclusion. So here we face half pot on the flop. This is, for all intents and purposes, a reg, by the way. They're running 22-19 over 2k hands. And just to reiterate, these hands are played by a student of mine, not by me. Pretty standard call for us. I mean, raising here is also an option, but call is going to be the front runner play, meaning the play that's taken at the highest frequency in theory. Villain goes for kind of small sizing, but this is fine on a flush turn. You don't need to be going really big when a card like this uncaps the big blinds range, so this is no problem. We decide to call this flush. I think that's reasonable. This is not one of our flushes that's going to want to raise at a really high frequency. And then seven of spades on the river, the dreaded four flush and villain. Then down bets eight big blinds. Pause the video. Have a think about this spot. What do you think this range is going to turn out to be in mass data? We actually have data for normal size bet, normal size bet, down bet. In triple barrel situations, we're going to see what our table in Grady says about that. That's episode one of Grady that we're going to look at in just a little while. So keep watching. We're going to get to the answer for this spot. I'll assume that you've developed a few ideas there. We'll see if they're right when we look at the course. Okay, and two, we'll get the answers to all of these at the end. So button raise is small here. We decide to call this is exactly the positional configuration that's going to be in the table we're going to look at in a minute. Button versus big blind, so it's nice when the positions align completely to what we're going to see, but we do cover all sorts of positions throughout the whole course, not just this one, of course. We cover three-bit pots as well. So we have a large C-bet here on Queen 7-6, which already skews things a little bit, I would say. I would say this is a bet that isn't going to be captured by most of the data. Most of the data we look at on triples 
the flop bet will have been a small one just because that's the most prevalent. So this already gives us cause to maybe take the data with a pinch of salt and say, okay, we know that most of the data we're looking at came after a small flop bet where ranges were wide. This triple barrel we're going to see here has originated after a big flop bet. We have to use that information. We don't just want to be reading data off a list in a brain dead fashion. Okay, normal turn sizing for the nine turn, I would say, although you could probably use some overbets here. We call again with pair plus straw, looks really standard. And we face a river overbet. This is also covered in Grady in the table we're going to look at. What does the sizing normally mean? But again, when we look up the answer, we're going to take it with a pinch of salt and we're going to say, well, how does this texture affect things? Because what we are going to look at is data for the average texture, for all textures, in fact, as an aggregate. So how does this specific texture affect things? The fact that it's three flush on the river. Have a think about that. And then how does the sizing affect things? And then how does the fact that villain bit big on the flop affect things? Do you want to fold here or do you want to call? We'll find out what the student did towards the end of the video. Okay, form an opinion about that one. Spot three, pocket sevens in the small blind. This is the third and final hand we're going to look up today. We flat here, that's fine. You can also three bet, of course, you can't fold. Three, nine, three. And we go for a check call against the small C bet. So this one is standard. The data we're going to look at is going to mostly come from small C bet. So this is within the normal realms of what usually happens. This is not, this is a bit of a weird turn, but we do classify textures like this in Grady. Generally speaking, there are 15 to 20 different classifications of texture in the course. When we get through to like lectures three and four, we really start talking about how board texture affects bluffing in a massive way. And also fold equity when we're the ones doing the bluffing. These are the key things to look at. How often do people fold when we bet and how often are people bluffing when they bet? These are the two staples of Grady of the Carrot Poker School. The sizing, you could definitely go much bigger. The three is such a tiny, tiny part of small blinds range. It's basically non-existent, in fact, from this position. This is a super capped versus uncapped. We're capped, they're uncapped kind of spot. So I would like to see Villain using like 2x pot, 3x pot of this SPR. Put more money in the pot for God's sake. You're value betting a range of mostly like good pair plus. Okay, maybe you have some thinner value bets like fives and sixes that want this sizing, but many of your hands here should be using 3x pot, 2x pot, like be brave. Don't be the average run of the mill reg that can't bet more than the pot. Don't be that guy. If you're that guy or girl, have a think about that. And you should really come to the conclusion that if you never overbet, that's right. You should learn to overbet because it's really good to put more money in the pot with your very big hands against cap ranges. Don't worry, you still deserve to play the game. You know, you're, you're worthy of that. You're going to be good one day. Keep going. We, of course, are going to make the call here, and we do. And the river comes a brick. This would be classified as low rainbow dry. I mean, okay, low two-tone dry, rainbow dry, that sort of thing in grady. Yes, it is kind of a tripped up board, which affects things a little bit, but it doesn't change the overarching idea that we're going to look at in just a minute when we see the data. Bellin goes for pot and we make the call. We can talk about how good this call is in a second. We'll see the results of the hands in a minute as well. But first, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you a little bit of grade E and let's look at the first table that's in grade E lecture one about how often people bluff when they're tripling. This is regs we're looking at today, button versus big blind. Let's go over the course. This is going to be fun. So what I'm going to do is skim through the first few slides of grade E lecture one. This is what the course looks like. This is the overlay we use to record it. These are the course aims. We're going to, in grade E, provide a framework for identifying where different strengths of exploit are available versus the reg and rec populations. This is me speaking to you live now, by the way. I have pre-recorded all of this officially. It's been fully edited, etc., etc. That spot's on carrot corner. Secondly, to rate each node, a node is simply a decision point on the tree. If you have the chance to call a river bet, that is a node. That's a particular node that you're facing. That you have to figure out the chance to bet the flop. That's a node too. Everything where you have the chance to act is a node. And we're going to describe the extent to which we are incentivized by the data, by the way people are playing over the millions and millions of hands that we've looked at, to over-invest or under-invest. So what this means is that when we are facing a bet, over-investing would mean to call more of our range to call hands that GTO is folding or mixing fold with, but to always call them. And just basically to say that we think calling is winning effectively. And thirdly, we're going to blend theory with practice. So throughout Grady, we always look at sims, not always, but we pull up pile extracts and different things from solvers, like the EV of certain hands, the equity of certain hands, the strategies, the frequencies, that kind of thing, in order to sort of get familiar with what should happen so that we can then look at what we think our opponents are actually doing and make a bit more sense of the data. 
Also, we can use this to figure out how far we want to deviate when we're actually building an exploitative strategy, which we do all the time throughout this course. The methodology that we're going to be using is firstly looking at mass data. That's the raw percentages of how often someone had a bluff when they took X line or how often someone folded against X line, that kind of thing. And we're going to assign a color and a number actually based on responsibly analyzed data. Responsibly here just means that we are accounting for things like some small biases that result just from, for example, the fact that when you call the river or you observe a hand where the river was called, the caller will normally have more blockers to top pair than they will to air, for example. Therefore, the equity is going to swing a little bit. So our mass data analyst has kind of advised us on exactly how that's going to happen. I've discussed it at great length with him and we've decided to make a couple of very small tweaks to the data just to account for those things to make sure it's as accurate as it can be. We assign a color, we assign a rating just to say how bluffed the spot is, how folded a spot is, and to what extent we want to overinvest or underinvest when we're building our own strategy. We're also going to use rational cognitive evaluation. This means that we're going to make sense of why things are the case. So if a spot is over bluffed significantly and we should be calling with all hands that have showdown value, then we'll want to understand why that's actually the case. You know, why are people over bluffing in that spot? What factors of that spot make it the case that the average human is bluffing too often? Because if we can identify it there, then we can also extrapolate that and identify it in other spots too later on in the course, or even some of the very few spots in the game tree that aren't covered in the course. Most of them are. And thirdly, we're going to use game theory to assess how large a deviation we can make. So for example, if somebody goes all in on the river for 2x pot, and in game theory, the solver says, you should call 6-5 third pair with this blocker, and you'd be winning one big blind in a pot of 200 if you call that hand. Well, because we know that it would be a very small deviation to fold that hand, and because we know, here's a freebie, recreational players grossly under bluff for 2x pot jams, we now know that it's very clear that we should be folding the 6-5 because we've only made a small deviation. So I just think people are so lazy in poker, they'll say like, oh yeah, the solver says we should call, but should we fold? But they don't look at the EV, guys. They really don't. And that's just such a silly thing to do. You need to know how winning something is in game theory, not just how often the play is being taken or whether it's being taken. So definitely always look at EV when you're using your solvers. That's certainly what we do when we use game theory in this course to show you how to actually use the mass data and how to deviate based on the mass data. So this is not a course where we just list percentages like in a big long list and get you to just click fold here and call here. We try and make you think in this course like we do in all modules of the Carrot Poker School. But the mass data is of course the driving factor. So in lecture one, which is the one we're going to take a table from today, got a little carrot exploitative mascot guy there that's you know, he's got some really expensive sunglasses from doing all the exploiting he's confident he's doing chip tricks he's basically he's the guy right he's the guy you want to be he's your role model you want to be that carrot not the other carrots that's your one so the five color system is actually became more than five colors because get this right we originally made spots rated one, two, three, four, and five, meaning one was you need to really under invest you need to fold a lot you need to not put much money into the bot and five was make lots of investments, people are over bluffing here, call a ton, or people are overfolding, so bluff your whole range, that kind of thing. But then we found that some spots were so unbalanced by pool as we were going through the data that we had to assign ratings like 9 and negative 3. So yeah, some spots are so profitable for you that we unearthed in this course that 1 to 5 wasn't a sufficient scale. We had to change it. And we also touch on sizing and position. In lecture one, we're not going to go through all of this today, of course, in the preview, but position, like where the opener was and what action sequence they took, that makes a big difference to where they're over bluffing, under bluffing, etc. Okay, so the five color system, as it was originally called before we extended it to be lots more colors, in principle, it's five colors that are outliers, that's the idea, is going to be described using the positional configuration. So we're going to describe a spot, that's to say, by using these three features. Firstly, positional configuration. So we're going to say this is button versus big blind single raise pot, two bet pot. That's what that means. Just to denote like what kind of spot we're in. We're also going to talk about the type of bet we face. Are we facing a river triple? Are we facing a probe? Are we facing a bet check bet line, a check check bet line, a check bet bet line? We'll be very clear about that so you know which kind of spot the data is for. And we're also going to let you know whether we're currently looking at regs or recreationals. The cool thing about grade E is that we actually use VPIP PFR filters. That's how often someone voluntarily puts money in the pot and raises pre respectively to separate these two populations. So we can actually look at how recs play a spot and then look at how regs play a spot and compare them. 
rather than just looking at the full pool, which is not as useful. Even in like anonymous games and stuff, you often get a good idea who the recreational players are and who the regulars are. This is the idea, these are the five labels we're going to use throughout grade E, but we'll also use ones like minus two and zero and seven in really extreme outlier cases, but these are the normal five that we use. And basically it's quite clear, the lower the number and the closer to red it is on the color scheme, the less you should be investing, the more you should be overfolding or under bluffing or just checking down and giving up and stuff like that. And then the more that it's green or a high number like five or even nine or 10 in some extreme cases, I don't think there's a 10 actually, I think there's a nine at some point, then you need to just basically bluff every time you have the chance to or call any hand that has the slightest bit of showdown value, you get the point. Let's meet the answer to some of these spots, then we'll jump back to the spot. Quick thing to say here is that the weak percentage that you see here, here's the data by the way, this is the first dose of mass data for you. Hope it whets your appetite for more. Weak refers to how often somebody showed up with a bluff, basically fourth pair or worse. So this doesn't normally encapsulate any value bets. It might, with the recreational players, capture some weird like fishy merges, which are kind of as good as bluffs when you've got second pair, I guess. So we're looking at how often somebody showed up in this column here with fourth pair or worse. In this column, we're looking at how often they should show up with that. Like what is the mathematical bluff frequency they should have in order for us to be breaking even by calling a random bluff catcher in our range. You know, a hand with average blocker properties that's just a bluff catcher that beats bluffs and doesn't beat value when we're playing against that polarized range. Here's the data. We are looking at ratings of five for all of these really big bets from regs. So when regulars, that's players who are known to be people with lower gaps in their VPIP and PFR, who aren't limping into pots and playing completely catastrophically widely pre-flop and stuff like that, when they use very big sizing, like overbet or even slight overbet or pot, they're overbluffing in late position. The position's important here, but they're overbluffing. And that's something that surprises a lot of people. By the way, you may be wondering, where's this data taken from? It's taken from stakes between 50 and 200 NL, mainly reg tables across a few different sites. So it's, it's fairly diverse, and I think for that reason, quite safe. It's not like we just looked at one stake on one site or something like that. We looked at a very big, varied player pool here. So as we can see, when regs attack you with three bets, the last of which, the river bet, is an over bet. That's what this refers to here, the river sizing for the triple barrel, the over bluffing, generally. Their weak percentage, the amount of the time they're showing up with a bluff, is a little more than they're supposed to be. But this is enough to swing your strategy entirely. It's a fallacy that people need to be really, really over bluffing by 10 or 15 percent. You know, it's a fallacy that you need 10 or 15 percent more equity to start calling all of your bluff catchers. You just need like three or four percent more equity because here's the thing. Blockers are not a big deal. They don't add that much to your win rate. If you use blockers really well on the river in most spots to call bets or fold, you're only actually moving the needle by about 1, 2, 3%, 4% in really extreme cases. However, when your opponents are actually over bluffing, you're winning 5% more often than you need to here, 6% for this one. You really need to call. So next time you face like a pot size bet on the river from a regular in late position that's a triple barrel, you should probably call, but there are textural exceptions and we're going to get into these when we go back over to the hand histories. It's not enough just to look at this table and say, well, it's that sizing. So I call, there's a ton of textual variation. This is where it gets really exciting. And later on in the course, we show you exactly which textures you need to be more cautious on. And we give ratings for textures. We plot them in graphs. We show you why it's the case. Texture is so powerful, but you don't get to see that today. I'm sorry. You only get to see that if you if you get the course. I can't give you everything in this one YouTube video. So if you've taken a minute to familiarize yourself with that data, you may be noticing this one down here. This is going to be key in answering our first hand. This is actually under bluffed three, means that they're bluffing it coincidentally. Usually it's a coincidence. These people are bad at poker. Coincidentally, the right frequency. That doesn't mean they're building the strategy well. It just means that they happen to be kind of balanced between bluffs and value. But when it's lower, like rating two, people are under bluffing and you should be overfolding. And when it's five, you know, four people are basically over bluffing and you should be over defending. With that in mind, the fact that we want to over defend against the bigger sizes and as the triple size gets smaller and smaller, it becomes less and less bluffed. This is not the same, by the way, for lots of other different nodes on the game tree, action sequences, player types. This is just regs. We're triple barreling, okay? So don't take this data and go and apply it to like facing a big overbet from a recreational or apply it to extreme board textures or apply it to completely different action sequences. Don't do it. It won't work. Disclaimer. 
This is just for triple barrels against regs in late position. Okay, back to the hands. So you remember this hand, the first one of the day. What did you think about this, by the way, before you looked at that data? Were you surprised? Let me know in the comments. So we have the open, we have the call, called the flop, we called the turn. There'll be some arguments for raising here against some player types, but I think call is the main line. And then the river is the seven of spades and villain bet small. This is very underbluffed. The thing about this spot is that it's extremely counterintuitive for a reg to decrease their river sizing when bluffing, when they've been going bigger earlier. That's a really weird thing to do. Like I'm going to bet kind of large, I'm going to bet kind of large, and then I'm going to just bet really small in relation to the pot when I'm bluffing the river. Most people don't do that. Don't project your own thoughts into villain. That's a big trap that people fall into. Don't be like, well, I might do this to rep or to make him think that. Yeah, that's not how poker works. We're looking at what people do by and large. And while there might be some people out there that just happen to have the same thought that you have, guess what? You're not that special. People don't have thoughts just because you had them. You don't get to manifest your thoughts into your opponent's brains. You're not some kind of mind-controlling, weird demon that can just take control of people's thoughts. Stop it. Use the data. This is a fold. This is definitely a fold. Texture. I'm not even going to talk about this today, but texture would have something to say on this as well. This comes later in grade E. But let me just give you guys a clue. This texture does not make us want to make an exception to the rule that we just said there. Because we're facing big bet, big bet, down bet, we know that this is under bluff. Villain is meant to be bluffing about 20% of the time, and they're not. They're bluffing less than that. So even though as you face a smaller and smaller bet, the pot odds get better and better, and you're more enticed to call, it's worse to call this sizing than it is for you to call a bigger bet generally in this spot, EV-wise. You should call some bigger bets here on certain textures, not saying this one. Also, bear one more thing in mind. This is hijack, not button. More about what that means later on in lecture one of grade e if you buy the course you'll know what i'm talking about number two this was the one against buttons so exactly the same position that we looked at in our table there in grade e they bet flop big now i told you to think about that the reason you should think about that is that this range is actually already as we're going to see at some point in the course big bets on the flop set things up such that people are not bluffing as much later because people are not very good at finding low EV bluffs with this. I'm giving you guys so much shit for free today. This is unbelievable. The amount of stuff I'm just giving away. I actually feel dirty. I feel like some people in the poker world are looking at this video being like, shut up, Pete. Stop telling these people this stuff. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to ruin your business because you're making the games too hard. Come at me, bro. Don't worry. This is just one video. Not that many people will see it. The people that will see it will forget about it. They'll like click something else on their feed in a minute and It'll be fine, guys. Chill out. Don't worry about it. They bet big on the turn. We call, and the river is the three of hearts. Over bet. Grady tells us to call, but this is a fold. What a terrible course. It's given the wrong verdict. No, it's not. I told you to use the data intelligently. The average spot against the reg where you face this sizing in late position on a triple barrel note is overbluffed, but this isn't because of the big flopsy bet and also because of the texture. And I'm not going to tell you exactly why that is. You'll find that out later, but this is a fold. Although, had the texture been different and the flop sizing been small, this would be a call. There we go. So mass data is really powerful. The student, by the way, is just getting these spots right instinctively. He's playing really well. He's a winning player. We actually saw this guy's results last week when we looked at the previous video on Friday there. Came out on Friday there. This is now Wednesday if you're watching this. This is launch day. This is grade E release day. Big day for me. Big day for Carrot Corner. Hence the polo shirt. Not really. Going to play golf after this. That's not why I put it on. Sevens calling small blind. 393. We saw this hand. We called two bets. This is overbluffed from a reg, and this guy looks like a reg. He's 25 20. This is overbluffed, and this is not a textual exception, and we do not have a sizing exception earlier on the flop here. We don't have like a big bet on the flop, so this is a call. Grady tells us it is. There are no exceptions here. If you made me rant about texture here, I would actually say this is one of the most overbluffed textures possible. I'm not going to tell you exactly why, because I can't give you all the secrets at once, just a few of them. But this is a call. And of course we win when we make the good call. If you make a good call, you win 100% of the time. You have to win 100% of the time to make a call. Because you, losing is untenable. You cannot lose. The feeling of losing is too painful. So you need to know that you have 100% equity. Of course not. You need a little bit more than what the pot odds dictate here. If you really want to be fussy about rake, you know, you need like 33%. If you ignore rake, if you factor in rake, maybe 34 or 35 and people are overbluffing more than that. We saw that from the data, but even more on this board, even more.
and even more because it's a small flop bet not a big one some of the big flop bets are trapped within the data as well so the small bet is actually a bit more over bluff than the big one but the small bet happens maybe five times more often than the big one so most of the data comes from the small flop c bet but anyway i'm rambling you get the point this is really cool we can use mass data to devastating effect Brady of the Carrot Poker School will help you annihilate your opponents. Having theory helps too. That's what the full scholarship is for. So if you do head over there and you've not yet got the theory course, go ahead and load the full thing into your basket if you think you're going to watch it all. That's 40 hours of Carrot Poker School videos, 10 for grade E, 30 for the school, 33 actually, 34, plus some time to do the exams if you're doing the school, the theory part of the school. But yeah, I'm, I'm super stoked today, guys. It's a big day for Carrot Corner. I've been really looking forward to this course dropping for a long time and I do hope this video has whet your appetite. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Any questions about the course, I'll be happy to answer them down below. Let's see what happens. This is a good day. I'll see you back here soon for more educational poker content. Bye for now, guys. Thanks for watching.